COVID is already reshaping markets globally. Will COVID trigger a seismic shift in consumer behavior as well? To provide us insights of how this post-COVID world may take shape, we're very excited about the expert panel discussion led by our good friend, Professor Damian McLaughlin of the University College Dublin. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Damian McLaughlin. I'm a professor uh, at the uh, Murphy Business uh, School in Dublin in Ireland. Uh, at the invitation of uh, Dr. Mark Lyons, the CEO and president of Alltech, uh, we're joined this morning to discuss the remaking of the market uh, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, which is uh, shaping the world. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Alltech and Mark's leadership uh, in this. Uh, I think these are questions, questions about the future of the market are key questions to all of us uh, in the food industry right now. It's tremendous to have that opportunity uh, to have this discussion today. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to, to acknowledge first responders, uh, frontline workers, particularly those frontline workers uh, in the retail and food supply chain who are part of our community uh, in the Alltech community. And I also wanted to recognize uh, the Alltech uh, employees, their families and people of the Alltech supply chain uh, around the world uh, who are continuing to support the production of uh, safe and healthy food. Uh, we appreciate your effort and we wish you and your families uh, safety and uh, good health, uh, particularly over the coming period. Um, we have a tremendous panel um, uh, with us today. Uh, I'll start um, with uh, Jessica. Uh, Jessica is, I think, uh, without without exaggerating too much, Jessica, uh, is almost certainly one of the uh, global leaders in reputation management in, uh, in the food industry. Uh, she's previously worked with uh, firms which we would generally regard as the leaders of our, of our supply chain uh, and of our industry, Syngenta, Cargill, uh, and of course, uh, one of the world's greatest retailers in, uh, in, in Kroger. Uh, Jessica, her, her uh, particular interest and topic uh, is in the social impact, uh, the inclusion or, or uh, the splicing of social Social impact uh, into strategy and the communication of that strategy at the at the corporate level. She was previously involved with the Kro the Kroger Zero Hunger Zero Waste Plan, uh, which many of us admired from a distance as actually having a significant impact both on the practice of retailers but also on the communities that they that they serve. Uh, her work in this uh, and this and other areas led to her being recognised as a woman of influence uh, in the food industry in, in 2019 and also in 2019, particularly for her work in Kroger to be recognized as a game, game changer in, in global food. Uh, I'll move next to, uh, to David McWilliams, who, like myself, is, uh, uh, is Irish. Uh, please don't hold that against either of us. Uh, he describes himself somewhat modestly as an economist, uh, but I have uh, known of him for um, I, a little bit more than 20 years, and I think of him as an interpreter of trends and an interpreter of the future, and that's certainly the role uh, that he plays uh, in Europe. Um, he's regularly acknowledges amongst the 10 most influential uh, economists in the world, and, and I think that influence comes because he makes a particular effort, which most economists don't, uh, to ensure that economics is actually understood uh, and appreciated by other people. He has a, a particular, and this when uh, when this crisis is over, I encourage you to consider visiting Ireland for two events that uh, that David runs. First is the Kill Economics uh, Comedy and Economics uh, event. Now, Kill Economics is a, a two words put together: Kilkenny, which is one of the nicest places to visit in Ireland, and of course, economics. And uh, David gets a bunch of his global uh, economist friends and a whole bunch of comedians to come along, and they celebrate. Uh, really tremendous ideas in, in global economics uh, and uh, and then have some fun uh, fun around that. And if you are, are slightly more highbrow than that, uh, David um, also runs the Dawkey Book Festival where he has invited many of the world's leading authors uh, to come to visit Dawkey, which is a very, very nice part of, uh, of Dublin to visit, lots of very nice pubs and restaurants. And every summer, uh, he and his wife organize the Dawkey Book Festival, which is absolutely worth, uh, worth the trip. David is a real economist in the sense he did previously work for some really large banks. Um, but I think the thing which he will be most famous for in the future is that the, as the father of Lucy McWilliams, uh, who is his very, very talented daughter. Um, so uh, she is a singer of considerable talent. And uh, you can find a link to her on SoundCloud on David's Twitter feed. And I strongly, if any of you like real music and particularly appreciate female, uh, female vocalists, this young lady is tremendously talented. Please, please check her out. 
Um, I've left Jack Bobo to last, Jack, because uh, a bit like myself, you're a long-term friend of, uh, of Alltech, and uh, many in our community would know you extremely well. Um, in, outside even of the Alltech community, people know you as a C CEO of Futuri Fu Futurity, if I got that the right way around. <laughs> Yep. Um, and I think probably Jack, um, at least is the highest profile um, uh, food foresight thought leader in the world uh, today. I was quite taken to note that he had given over 400 speeches in 50 countries. Uh, that is uh, quite the uh, travel uh, travel air miles, Jack. And uh, yeah. I hope you get back on the road uh, quickly spreading the good news about the uh, about the future, future of food. Uh, Jack has a very distinguished uh, career in public service uh, uh, behind him also and served as a food advisor in the U.S. Department of, of State for uh, for 12 or 15 years. Uh, and it seems like he's trained in every uh, scientific discipline, uh, psychology, uh, uh, science, uh, and also in law. So a genuinely uh, multidisciplinary approach to things. And again, Jack has been recognized as amongst the, the 100 most influential people uh, in global uh, biotech. Uh, so we've got a tremendous panel uh, here today to, to think through this issue, this challenge that all tech have prevented uh, to us, which is uh, the remaking of uh, of the market. David, I might I might start with uh, I might start with you and ask ask a question, which I think is on is on all of our minds. Uh, I, I was in Berlin about four weeks ago, and um, we had this little sort of virus going around, which a lot of us thought was the flu. And I went to bed one Wednesday night, and I got up the next morning, and it was a major crisis. What exactly? is going on? Is this an economic crisis, a health crisis, a political crisis? How should we understand what's happening in the world right now? Uh, good afternoon, Damien. Uh, as you know, it's uh, actually uncharacteristically sunny day in Dublin, but I'm uh, down <laughs> in the basement here. Uh, it's lovely to be here, and thanks very much for all tech for having me over. Like yourself, in actual fact, Damien, I was in Bergamo in northern Italy, Berlin and New York in the last uh, three weeks. So of all those hotspots, I've been in them all. What's going on, Damien, is a economic, financial, political and health crisis all coming together in an almost perfect storm, which I don't think anybody has had any sense was going to come. People thought it was over in China. It's now here. So I think the first and most important thing to appreciate, Damien, is that this is a one-off shock to the global economic system. That's the first thing. The second thing to appreciate, it's a shock that we're all suffering at more or less the same time. So this part of Europe and Western Europe is about 10 days behind Central Europe. And by Central Europe, I mean Northern Italy. Uh, the United States is probably about another 10 days ahead of us in terms of this uh, plague, which is exactly what it is, moves eastwards uh, from China. And as a consequence of that, looking at the world as we always used to do in various different blocks might not be that helpful for the moment. We might just look at the world as an aggregate. And I think it's also important, Damien, to remember where we were at when the pandemic struck in terms of where in the economic cycle were we. So in terms of where the economic cycle is going to go, uh, one of the factors you have to be completely cognizant of is where we were, let's say, in February, early March of 2020. And where we were is we were at the tail end of a very long, quite robust recovery after the 2008 crisis. The United States itself uh, was about 10 or 11 years into the recovery, uh, the European Union a little bit less, and of course in China and in Asia, they were the countries that actually dragged us out of 2008. So what I like to look at is I want to talk about the financial, economic, credit, liquidity, banking area first. Um, I always try, I was talking to Mark earlier on or a couple of uh, weeks ago about the framework that I have to look at what's going on. And the framework is a framework which I would call, which economists call the Minsky cycle. So it's after an economist called Hyman Minsky, who basically plotted how all economic and financial cycles progress. And I think it's very important to locate where we were before we hit and how we're going to end up. So the Minsky cycle 
basically says that every long economic cycle comes to an end. It usually comes to end with a financial calamity of some sort. Uh, and then you start again. You re reset the button. So in 2008, 2009, we had the financial crash. Then the Federal Reserve comes in. Federal Reserve injects QE, which is loads and loads of, if you want to call it, almost free money into the market to kickstart the recovery. So Minsky said there's six stages in these cycles. So the first case, phase is what he calls displacement, when something real happens, when there's a change in policy. Now, in this context, that change in policy was the Fed reducing interest rates and injecting liquidity into the post-crash economy. The second phase is then recovery, when asset prices two weeks begin ago, to David. rise a little bit. Hmm? This is when two weeks ago, their recent... Uh, no, no, no this, I'm, I'm trying to in get context, Damien, where we are now. To, I, I want to talk to you about 2008, 2012, okay. 2016, okay. to get to where we are, are now. So okay. second phase is sort of a recovery. Okay, asset prices rise, house prices rise, liquidity conditions get better. This is about 2012, 2013. And the third phase is what uh, Minsky calls gearing, which is when the banks get involved in the business, they start to lend. In this cycle, it wasn't the old-fashioned banks, uh, it was more the shadow banks, private equity, etc., who come in, they inject liquidity into the system, asset prices begin to rise, the stock market begins to rise very rapidly, house prices begin to rise very rapidly, credit spreads for all sorts of uh, not particularly well-capitalized co companies begin to fall, and you get this massive takeoff. And then, of course, you get a situation where you get to the boom stage. And the boom stage is more or less where we were when this cycle has been stopped in its tracks by COVID. And the boom phase is the phase that J.P. Morgan, Damien, said is best described as uh, nothing so undermines your financial judgment as the sight of your neighbor getting rich. And that's when, for example, the stock market's an all-time high. Companies are buying back, uh, buying back their shares. You have interest rates beginning to, to rise a little bit. The economy itself is booming. In the United States, unemployment was at its lowest level ever. And that's where we were around uh, February. And then the, the next stage in the Minsky cycle is what he would describe as distress when sellers, early sellers get out. And again, that was happening in January, February of this year. And then you have the final stage, which is exactly where you are now, which is called the Torschuss panic. And the reason it's called that is because these cycles occurred in Germany and Austria more than any other place in the world in the 19th century. And ultimately what happens then, Damien, is everyone tries to get out because of a shock to the system, but there's nobody letting them out. That's why it's called a shut door panic. So I think it's important for them to see the big, long, long phase. So we are now at this panic situation where financial markets are down maybe 20%. Emerging markets are getting clobbered. Capital is fleeing out of emerging markets. Liquidity is a problem. This looks like a huge default calendar on the horizon. And of course, what we all have is this lockdown in various different stages. So the question is, where do we get out economically? Now, I'm not going to forecast five or six years. I think the, I'll leave that to the other guys who are much better at the long term than I am. But I'll try and get us to about next December, which I think just after the American presidential election. At the moment, it seems that the path for the economies, which are now, let's, let's, let's have a look at the numbers. We're talking about 20% falls in quarter-on-quarter -quarter GDP. We have never seen this ever, ever. We're looking at huge, huge increases in the rate of unemployment. Uh, at this stage, America, there could be 30 million Americans unemployed by next week or the week after. We're looking at absolute carnage in financial markets. We are looking at absolute carnage in leveraged companies. We're looking at a total destruction of liquidity. Yes, the central banks are trying. Yes, the Federal Reserve is trying. Yes, the Trump administration, the European Union are trying to inject uh, liquidity. But that's just a holding pattern for an economy that has been really put to sleep in effect. It's in hibernation. Now, I think the question, and I, I will, I'll hopefully be a little bit briefer on this. The question is, what happens next? for markets and for the economy. And I think the next big set of data that we're going to have to look at and we're going to get in the next couple of weeks will be on the anti 
don't data. Okay, so basically, we're going to have to look and see what sort of evidence do we have in antibody data. So there's two types of tests, as you know. One is a test to see whether you have the disease. The other is a test whether to see whether you had the disease. This is what we are in Europe kicking into now. And the question what we're hoping is that the antibody data will show that there have been a huge amount of people infected in the herd, in the population, okay? If the anti antibody data show that in actual fact an enormous amount of people have been infected, then I think financial markets will do what they call this V-shaped recovery. This is the idea that they will think the lockdowns will be short-lived, we will get back to normal, the fiscal and monetary stimulus will kick in, and what will happen is this pent-up demand, which has been in the system for people being locked down for five, six weeks, will emerge, and what we will have is this short, sharp recovery. That is all predicated on the idea that lots of us have had the disease, lots of us have recovered, have an immunity, and consequently the fear of the second wave or third wave doesn't rescind, but it becomes less and less Armageddon type. Now we're seeing this in Germany, in Austria, in Denmark and Sweden. All these companies, countries are opening up a little bit right now and intend to do so over the course of the next uh, few days and weeks. Damien, the big fear is that the antibody data shows us the opposite, okay? And that is that very few people have actually contracted the disease. The rates of mortality are higher than we thought and the disease is in the community, okay? And if that is the case, then the total shutdown, which we're going through now, will go on for some time, okay? And that is the Armageddon case, because that means that the fiscal and monetary stimulus, which is what the ECB and the Fed and the Bank of Japan and the Bank of China have been doing, will actually gradually wear off. It means the defaults will come to the fore. It means the credit spreads will become much tighter. And it means that the fall in financial markets will be much more significant and prolonged. All of these will feed into the local economy. It means that unemployment will stay longer than we expected. Consumption will fall dramatically. Investment decisions will not be taken because there's no visibility. So over the course of the next two weeks, Damien, there will be this crucial data coming out from countries that are testing, which is largely from European countries which are testing uh, at much significant, more significant rates than the United States at the moment. And my own sense is that it'll neither be the Armageddon case, which very few yeah. of us have been infected, nor will it be the benign case that we have almost herd immunity, but it'll be somewhere in the middle, Damien. And then mm. we roll on towards the American presidential election, and it has significant, we come back to it, geopolitical, economic, and financial consequences for the year of our Lord 2020, which I think I will stick with. Yeah. David, uh, one one question of, of clarification to that. Um, assuming the worst case scenario in terms of the antibodies that it's actually a low percentage, the, the outer limit then of the crisis is the point at which uh, uh, an adequate vaccine uh, is put on the market, which is maybe 12 or 18 months away. Um, is that a fair assumption to make? And yeah, is I mean, the that's, possibility that's, of, of a V-shaped recovery after 18 months, is that is that technically not possible? Or uh, that, that, You see, the, the, the problem with this uh, is that, like all crises, you actually run out of time. That's what happens in a crisis. You don't really run out of money because the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, can actually print this stuff. And in actual fact, now we're seeing what's called helicopter money in economics, yeah. which is injecting money directly into people's accounts, which is absolutely what we have to do. Absolutely what we have to do. We have to tear up all the rule books. This is not a situation where the rules that applied last Christmas apply now. They don't. This is an emergency the global economy is in ICU, and what you do to a patient in ICU is much more different than what you do to a patient who has just arrived in and is feeling a little bit ill. We are in a crisis. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that if this goes on very long, okay, then clearly what happens to the economy is two things. One is that the anybody who has been leveraged, anybody who's overborrowed, goes bust, okay? 
And there's a thing called death deflation in economics, which was uh, Irvin Fisher, the great American economist, wrote a seminal paper in 1933 about it. What actually happens when deflation takes hold, okay, so wages fall, prices fall, wages fall. The debt you took out when your wages and income were high now becomes unsustainable. So you default and you have that horrible uh, bank debt dilemma that we saw in 2008. In order to avoid that, we need this quick recovery. And the fear is that if we're waiting just for the vaccine and if we don't have a certain amount of what they call herd immunity, okay, that the vaccine might take too long and then the companies that are in trouble go bust. And also, don't uh, forget that a lot of people who lose their jobs, and we're talking 20 or 25 million Americans, if unemployment goes on for a long time, you actually become unemployable, that you lose your skills, and uh, you tend to have what's called just pockets of long-term unemployment. So, And the the third factor is Damien, at what stage can the government keep printing money? Where does it stop? Uh, My own sense is that when you're faced with deflation, which we are, inflation is not a problem and you should continue on this trajectory. But there comes a moment where either the markets or the central bank themselves feel that the markets abandon the currency or the bond market and say, look, you've too much debt, we don't want to finance you anymore. Or the central bank feels that it can't monetize debt Uh, at this rate. Hopefully the best example of this is the Bank of Japan, Damien, which has been monetizing Japanese debt since 1992, right? So this can go on for quite some time. And as we know, the Japanese economy has slowed down, but is clearly not an economy that in any way has showed signs of catastrophe. In actual fact, the Japanese economy is still a very sophisticated place. Yeah. And it's still a nice place, nice place to live also. Jessica, I might draw you in at that at that point. I, I think David has given us um, a, a very stark uh, view of the the, the macro uh, economy. Uh, but you've your expertise is in the supply chain. Um, one of my uh, Chinese friends said to me that um, social order is maintained because Wi-Fi works, mobile phones work, and there's food in the shops. And uh, it seems we should give a lot of credit to people in the food supply chain uh, for keeping food in the, in the store. What is happening in the food supply chain? How are stores managing uh, to keep open and, and how are they keeping food on the shelves? Thank you, Damien. And uh, I really am excited to join today. Thank you to the All Tech team for having me and to include me in your community. It's my first time participating with this group, so I just wanted to express my gratitude. And great question, Damien, and I'd love to build off of a few of David's excellent comments and address that topic. So my section is going to talk about two main categories. First is the how we grocery shop, to your point about the supply chain, and then a little bit on the what we shop for in the retail food supply chain. So let's start first with the how people eat in grocery shop today and get grounded in some of the sector macroeconomics. Think of this as how point one. In the US, the food and beverage space is approximately $6.2 trillion, which is about 12.5% of the nation's retail total. Now, something really important happened in the way that people eat way back in 2015 that wasn't really talked about, and that was, for the first time in human history, the consumption of food prepared outside of the home was greater than the amount of food prepared inside the home, otherwise known as stuff you bought at the grocery store and brought home and made for dinner or lunch or whatever it was that you were feeding your family that day. Now, that was a pretty big deal. And in the retail sector, we kind of walked around for the past few years saying that if you could snack on it, you could drink it or eat it in the car, well, good luck keeping it on the shelves. Now, fast forward to today. COVID-19 has created a massive shock to that trend line. And sector analysts believe that in Q2 alone this year, you're going to see $100 billion shift back from the restaurants and food service space into that retail grocery space. So that brings us to the how point two, which is the retail footprint and the supply chain topics that you referenced. 
Now, if you remember one thing from my discussion part here in this in this chapter of our all tech panel, it should be that not all retailers are created equal. There are the haves and then there are the have nots. The headlines are full of stats right now about furloughs and layoffs, which talks about some of the things that uh, David had mentioned that were going to be impacting this election cycle and the social fabric of the world for years to come. Last week alone, we saw that retail in the U.S. laid off 1 million workers, and 60,000 stores have been closed in the U.S. alone for the past few weeks now. Now, the grocery space is very different, and you see that in the headlines. In fact, the food industry and the grocery space is one of the only sectors that's actively hiring right now and is advertising for thousands of jobs. And currently, workers are able to negotiate very differently than they ever have been before. Now, this has led to two big trends. The first is wage increases, and the second is faster accommodation of requests that were previously slow walked. Now, both wage increases and capital requests were slow walked before for very good reason, which is the macroeconomics of the retail grocery business are not so great, typically about two and a half cents on the dollar. So going forward out of COVID-19, you're going to have higher OG&A in the form of wages and comparatively expensive new processes that will cut into profits long term. Now, these trends will lead to serious structural compromises for the retail grocery industry and its profitability that will be a hangover for years to come. Now, I'll go back to this point that not all retailers are created equal. And if you think about someone like an Amazon, who is a recent and more recent entrant into the retail grocery space, their $2 trillion of market cap mean that they can continue to invest almost indefinitely into a retailer like a Whole Foods that they bought. The Walmart ecosystem is also incredibly strong and well capitalized, as are a few other national players. So there are strong regional players who will hunker down and stand a good chance of surviving. And then there are very strong national and international players who will also thrive during this period. The retailers who are going to struggle will be the independents. Now, this was approximately 40% of the retail grocery sector before, and they were already running on fumes of it given a slight lifeline after tax reform in the U.S. in 2018. So no doubt going forward. Local mom and pop stores there, or do you mean mean, uh, smaller regional chains when you say independents? Yeah, so smaller regional chains and independent grocers. That was 40% of the grocery market before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, they're going to be in trouble. And again, many of them got a second lease on life with tax reform here in the U.S. um, or this growth of this boom cycle, boom stage that David referenced. Uh, But what we're going to see now is that the time is running out on those little guys. And you're going to see a real consolidation and a possible set of monopolies, whether they're national or even regionally held monopolies. So that's the brick and mortar footprint. There's going to be a lot of rationalization. But the biggest change that we're all seeing right now and probably experiencing is in the e-commerce space. And that leads us to our insight, a third insight under the how people shop or how number three here. So previously, the UK was the highest e-com grocery market at 7%, which was in part created by the team at Ocado. And, you know, I got to know the Ocado team and visited their flagship shed and also their urban micro fulfillment center, which was designed for one hour delivery a couple times over the past few years. And it's incredibly cool stuff. Now, by comparison, going into COVID-19, the U.S. grocery shopping was only less than 4% done online. But a new report and study that was issued on March 13th, which was pretty early on to all into all of this, by the way, showed that one third of the U.S. bought food online that week. And 41% of them, which is nearly half, this was said this was their very first time they had ever bought food online. Now, this is a massive migration of human shopping behavior that has changed in a heartbeat. Um, David mentioned his Minsky theory. Well, you know, I'll mention Thaler, who won the 2017 Nobel Prize for Economics for his nudge theory. Uh, There's nothing nudgy about what we saw over the past couple of years. In fact, it should probably be named Zoom theory um, after the fast (laughs) and rapidly evolving technology. But the business has gone to a few key players. And here, this bridges back to the point that not all retailers are created equal. So according to the study, here's where the business went. 58% went to Walmart, 14% went to Amazon and Whole Foods, and then 10% went to Target. 
the rest of it, which is pretty a small section, right. less than that 40%. Um, so the e-com world isn't mirroring the bricks and mortar world. Um, the rest of it was fragmented. There are some really big winners in this e-com land grab that we've seen in COVID-19. And you know, I mentioned Zoom a minute ago, but if my 73-year-old mom could become a Zoom ninja overnight to see her grandkids, well, there's no doubt that those adoption barriers that previously seemed insurmountable or slow going are going to come down for people when they shop for groceries online. And a huge portion of those fat folks will never go back to brick and mortar. So e-commerce basically got its big break due to COVID-19, and that trend is going to stay. So what I'd like to just quickly do is talk about the how. We talked about the what or the what people, or sorry, I just talked about all the hows people grocery shop. I want to come back to the what people grocery shop for. So the next big bucket is the what people shop for and what trends will stay and what trends will go. So for the sake of time, I'm going to keep that at a very high level because there are a million micro trends under the surface that we could discuss. But I'm going to touch on science versus food, food is medicine, and then food for good. So first, science versus food or the what number one. Now, I've been in the food and ag supply chain space for over 25 years, which coincided with the introduction of biotechnology over in Europe. And in fact, I worked at Monsanto in Europe during the time of the GMO launches. And when I went back to business school, the day they taught that case study um, was one I had a lot to say about possibly what not to do when you're introducing a new technology um, to an entire continent and really to a whole planet. But in my nearly three decades in the food supply chain, there's never really been a rousing cry that I've heard for more science in people's food. Now, that might change in this moment with COVID-19. We might be at the tipping point where society could permit science to re-enter the discussion on food. So COVID-19 has effectively led to a reappreciation of scientists, of science, of doctors, and the return of experts in general. And we might have a new newfound appetite for letting experts do more to ensure food security versus just hope for the best. And this also means that we could possibly feed the 10 billion and better preserve our planet if we are to incorporate science into the solution. And this will, of course, have reverberations in the plant-based space, which was white hot in the retail sector uh, right before the COVID intervention. Um, And that was due to brands such as Beyond Meat or Impossible, but then also in the extremely nascent cellular protein space. So if we move on to the what number two, this food is medicine idea, I mean, previously, we were already seeing doctors who were writing prescriptions for food. The biggest killers were diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension, all of which have a huge dietary component, and all of which are contributing and complicating factors if somebody comes down with COVID-19 today. Now, COVID-19 has brought an obsessive focus back to our individual health and reacquainted us with the personal accountability for keeping ourselves healthy. There's a resurgence of exercise, and as we've already discussed, people are cooking at home again versus eating out. Now, judging by the parade of neighbors that I see at my window now all the time, there are a few winners during this pandemic. And first, I think they happen to be the dogs. Their Their owners are home all the time, and they're getting walked a lot more. There's a lot of winning with the step counters out there. My husband is involved in a challenge and he's in a fight for the death with this woman down in Florida where they're always out uh, fighting each other for the step counting. And then the other big winner, I think, is our own personal involvement, care for and recommitment to our health. And that brings me to the final point in, in the what number three category here, which is the sustainability aspect or environmental, social, and governance trends that were such a hot topic coming out of Davos um, in the conscious capitalism space and ESG was really the main conversation prior to COVID-19. And I just want to reiterate that now ESG is not apart from COVID-19. It's a part of this discussion of how we pull ourselves forward. And a trend that will stay is that people will will care about the ethics of their food supply chain. And this will be especially in a recession um, that wasn't anybody's fault. They're also going to continue to really care about how their products are packaged. And then we're also destined for a reckoning over how food waste contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. So we've covered the how people eat, and we've seen a huge and likely irreversible set of trends taking place. To summarize, those are people are eating at home again. Bricks and mortar footprints will rationalize and e-com has hit the inflection point. And then we discuss the what people eat. 
The big ideas there are science could be making a comeback food as medicine and health will matter, and that people will be more in tune with environmental, social, and governance topics and conscious capitalism in all of their choices, but especially in how they eat. Jessica, thanks. um, Were you surprised that the food supply chain, and particularly the retail end of it, given how economically weak it's been in recent years, how easily they were able to respond to this sudden spiking in demand and you know at a minimum 50 percent switch of calorie intake from food service back into retail i mean it's it's something to be celebrated a, a little bit i think is it yeah well look i have always felt especially knowing what i know about the food agriculture supply chain i've been on the farm input side i've been on the processor side and then i've been on a retail side and i always feel as if we should have always been clapping for the retail grocery workers we should frankly be clapping for the milk that is sitting in the back of the store that is at a reasonable price point is safe and it's fresh. I mean, what I know about the ag supply chain is it's pretty much a miracle that that milk is there safely at that price point. I think we took a Mm -hmm. lot for granted about our food supply chain previously that we probably never will be again. Now, the thing I will Mm -hmm. say to your question here is retail is a fast moving in the now business. That's what it's known for. You know, the the weekly ad and getting the items on the shelves. Um, Retail is one of the hardest working and friendliest sectors that's out there and very purpose driven. So they really are, especially grocery food retail, really, this is them at their best. This is them taking care of their communities. This is them feeding their neighbors. And this is them having a very concrete set of actions to do. Um, You know, where you see retail grocery sometimes fall down is in the longer term strategic lens. Um, if you get a big disruptor like an Amazon who enters the space, but what they're really good at is high energy blocking and tackling and getting the food on the shelves. And we shouldn't estimate how efficient the global supply chains were going into this, uh, going into this cycle. Super. Thank you. I think the, uh, I think you're right. I think it's something that we should celebrate and and maybe remind ourselves that these food supply chains were were largely built in the U.S. Um, and in Europe um, post Second World War to ensure that we would have um, uh, food security and and safety for all of our all of our people. And Jack, you and I have been involved in a couple of fora where th- those very structures and systems have been identified uh, as causing problems. Uh, and the, again, the problems you and I have talked about before. Uh, in terms of health uh, and uh, and, sus- and sustainability. But Jack, I wonder um, if you could give us your insights in terms of what is happening specifically at the consumer level um, in this four or five weeks, I guess, since we've learned about what COVID-19 act- actually is. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here as well. It's great to talk to you and to hear from the others. Uh, I think that David and Jessica have actually covered a lot of uh, really important ground, so I probably won't won't speak quite as long. Uh, before I go, though, uh, into what's been happening on the ground and the consumer, uh, let me step back for a moment and talk a little bit about what it is that I'm doing in terms of uh, futurism and looking at the future of food. And one of the things that people sort of get wrong when they think about futurists is that they think that we're trying to predict what the future is. And instead, it's not about trying to predict the future, but it's trying to figure out what are possible futures. And then among those possible futures, identify the preferred future and then see if there's a way of getting there. And so we have all of these forces that are shaping the trends that we read about in the newspaper and that we see on television. And those forces come down to economic forces, environmental forces like climate change, politics, social issues. Uh, But today, I think with COVID-19, we also have a a new force, and that force is this pandemic that's going to work its way through the economy uh, for a very long time to come. And building on what David said, I don't think most of us quite appreciate the long-term consequences uh, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, economically, financially, uh, that COVID is going to have on people in the United States and around the world, particularly if the crisis uh, continues through the summer. 
And part of that is that we're, we're not thinking about uh, the person who lost their job has less than a week or so of wages. Most people are living paycheck to paycheck. And so the crisis for them started the day they stopped working and the day that their last paycheck arrived. And to put that person into perspective, within the last year, 40% of all Americans did not have the money they needed uh, to buy the food they wanted at some point. So that means 40% of Americans were so on the edge that at some point they just couldn't buy the food before this crisis occurred. And so if you now have people that are uh, starting to uh, figure out what are they going to do after that paycheck, the crisis doesn't have to last very long for that to have this dramatic impact on their daily life. And for people who are younger, it's not just going to be a crisis. The paychecks are going to start coming and they're going to get over it. Uh, for many people uh, in Generation Z, this could have a profound impact on how they see the world for the rest of their lives. And again, to think about the uh, comparison, some have compared it to 9-11, some have tried to compare it to the Great Depression. And if we were talking about 9-11, um, well, less than 3,000 people died in that attack, and it was fairly localized. And so not necessarily everybody in the United States, everybody in around the world were aware of it, but it didn't necessarily touch their lives directly. On the other hand, we have 10,000, more than 10,000 people just in the United States who have already died. Those numbers could mount. It could be 10, could be 20 times the number. And so many people, if not most people, will be touched by this crisis. And it's not just going to last uh you know, one day like 9-11, it's going to last months and its uh, economic implications, its mental and psychological implications are going to last for years. So I think that's part of the context for this conversation is really thinking about not just how it impacts people today and tomorrow and what how we can recover, but the mental psychological aspect of it as well. And when we start to think about the psychology of this, that, that gets to the, the question that you asked. And what we saw during the first uh, week or so is we saw a lot of panic buying. And it didn't necessarily make a lot of sense to people because, you know, did we really need to have 80 rolls of toilet paper? Uh, but what was happening has a lot to do with psychology. Now, some of it is just retail therapy. You know, if you're not able to do the things that you normally do, you can go into the grocery store and you can buy things. Well, that gives you a sense of control. And so that was very important during those early days when there was a lot of uncertainty that people could at least have control over what they purchased. Now, when it comes to, you know, why did everybody buy toilet paper? You know, not everybody thought that they needed that much control over uh, what was going on in the bathroom. But what happens there is that you look at the cart next to you and it turns out that toilet paper and uh, uh, other things are, are really large. And so people could look and they could see that other people were buying those items. And at that point, people think, well, it's not that I really think we need it, but what if tomorrow I come back and it's not there? So those people begin to watch what others are doing. And so uh, it actually makes a fair amount of sense for people to copy what others are doing, even if what they're doing is not necessarily rational. So we've gotten past that moment. And it, when you look at food prices, uh, there was a huge spike in uh, beef purchases and poultry and other things in the United States. Um, and prices, though, have, have quickly come back down. Uh, in fact, for chicken and pork, they're actually uh, less uh, in the United States than they were uh, a year ago at this time. So, so that's part of the good news. But some of this uh, psychology has an impact on what other countries are doing as well. So you have a number of countries around the world that are putting into place export bans, and they're worried about the, their public having enough food. But we saw the same sort of uh, action taking place back in 2008. And unfortunately, it has a ripple effect throughout the entire global economy. So it's quite possible that there's plenty of food in the world to feed everybody. And yet, as people and countries put into place these export bans, it has a negative impact on everybody. 
And so uh, just because you have the food, if people aren't able to access it, uh, then we can have these uh, uh, challenging times. And that sort of brings us to the question of friction in our food system generally. And so it's not a question of whether or not there is enough food. There will be enough calories in the world to feed people. Uh, but if it doesn't reach the people in the right place at the right time, at the right price, then we will have a real challenge. And as I mentioned, a lot of people aren't going to have the money and the resources in order to buy it. And so if there's too much friction, then that's going to cause the prices to increase. So there are different areas that we're currently seeing friction in our food system. Uh, we're seeing it in the, the labor side uh, in the United States and other places with seasonal workers. If you don't have anybody to uh, uh, pick and, uh, the food or to, uh, to process it, then you're going to have a problem. Uh, if you get to the processing facilities and there's an outbreak, uh, there have been challenges in uh, places already. Tyson's has talked about problems uh, at some of their facilities. And that can also cause disruptions. Uh, back in 2019, in August, there was a single uh, beef production facility in the United States had to shut down for a little while. That was only 5% of production. Uh, but what we saw is that it had led to an increase in price for the consumer. So that small disruption caused an increase in price. But unfortunately, that also meant that there were fewer places for livestock producers, for ranchers to send their animals for processing. So they actually started getting less money. So some of this friction leads to these strange outcomes where consumers are paying more for a product. Those who produce it are getting less money for that product, which is sending exactly the wrong signal to those who produce our food that maybe they don't need to be producing as much. And so this friction in our system goes to transportation uh, in many parts of the world. The number one impact right now is on uh, you know, trucking and facilities, having the people to be able to get the products and also to be able to get across borders with checks and other things. So that friction is, again, causing challenges. And then we get to the retailer uh, that Jessica was talking about and you know, finding the workers and if there are continued challenges and people have to stay home, that that could also cause further disruption. And so all of these different forces are at play right now and how they come together and how long this lasts uh, will have profound impacts on how people think about the future of food. And just a, a couple of quick points uh, before I turn it back to you relates uh, to the winners and the losers in this. And Jessica has already talked a little bit about this and uh, on one side, the winners are likely to be big food companies, big organizations that have deeper pockets and are better able to weather uh, this situation. And the downside is that many innovative tech startups and others uh, are, are not going to be in a position to weather this at all. And so that could have a, a real impact on innovation coming out in the next few years, um, the willingness of venture funds and others to put money into this sector. So that could have a profound impact. Uh, but it's not just about uh, deep pockets. It's also that the psychology of it is that consumers are not just turning to the big brands because they've got deep pockets. They don't really care or think about that. They're returning to them because it's comfortable. Uh, they, they're, it's a return to the basics. And that's a different psychological impact that means that even if the companies, uh, the smaller niche producers, premium products survive this current situation, consumers may not be as likely to go back to them because there is this return to comfort and basics and a recognition that those big brands uh, actually do offer us something. That stability, that experience is really important to people at a time like this. And it could be something that they take away from this uh, going into the future. So I'll stop there and uh, we can get into some Q&A. Uh, looking forward to it. Thank you, Jack. I, I, think it's, um, I think it's worth saying and just pausing for a moment um because i don't think this is a, a just a a us phenomenon but the idea that in 2020 that 40 percent of the population can't afford to buy the food that they want is something that we should be ashamed of uh, in one sense and also mm -hmm. those of us who are committed to the food industry um should redouble our efforts to make sure that that situation changes i don't believe it's the fault of the food chain per se uh, but it is a societal issue. I think it's worth pausing just on that on that for a moment. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I would like to, to jump in on, on what you're saying. So yeah. I, I think it's it's absolutely unacceptable that that percentage in the United States, and when you think about it, that you know even before this crisis, 800 million people went to, hung, to bed hungry every day. Uh, that's unacceptable. That's 12% of all the people on the planet. Uh, but to put that into context, 50 years ago, 36% of all the people on the planet went to bed hungry. And so, you know, it, it's a question of, you know, are things bad and getting worse or good and getting better, but not fast enough? Before COVID, I think the answer was clear that things were good and getting better, but just not fast enough. Uh, the real question is that, you know, do the this, this 200 year trend towards things getting better, um, all of a sudden change, and we actually have numbers that are moving in the wrong direction a year from now. Uh, that's what keeps me awake. Yeah. Um, the thing I wanted, maybe if you wouldn't mind, just comment for another minute or two, Jack, on um, on on this the sort of psychology of the consumer in, in the future. I guess the the generation that's most susceptible uh, to that kind of influence now is maybe people in their twenties and thirties, and and those people have had you know two major once in a lifetime shocks in in ten or fifteen years, the two thousand eight. Uh, uh, global financial crisis and 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 now this and if they're a little bit older, and certainly from the Western world, they've also had um, um, they've also had nine uh, eleven, which was a shock to all of our systems uh, in terms of um, in terms of how we live our lives. What are you thinking about um, in terms of the changes to the psychology of the consumer? What would be your sort of headline points on that? Yeah. So I, what I think is that, you know, the, the younger the consumer, so, you know, those who are under 25 uh, are, are going to be the most impacted in terms of long term psychological uh, approaches and how they just see the world. Uh, those that are you know, 25 to 35. Uh, yes, this is a new crisis for them. Uh, for them, it's going to have a lot to do with their ability to to find and maintain work. You know, they're out there in the workforce. These are the most important years for them to really get started. And if we have 20% unemployment, um, that is going to have a, a dramatic impact on their ability to, uh, to get on a good track for their entire life. Uh, so for them, it, it, it's more this economic impact. But for younger folks, I think that it's really going to have a psychological impact. It's going to change how they think about the relationship to food, uh, to the world around them. And in that regard, I think that there's this possibility that instead of it uh, being this huge disruption, it's accelerating some trends. And Jessica talked a little bit about that, uh, home purchases. Uh, but it could lead to some reversals uh, where people are going back to big food companies. But they're also uh, a return to the idea of cooking at home and other things. And so I think that consumers are going to come out of this. I, I don't see that huge uh, growth spurt for all of them coming out of it. I think that this could be a new normal in how people think about consumption and consumer goods. Okay. Jack, I wanted to I wanted to move the conversation on uh, a, a little bit. And I, I read... Um, I read something a number of years ago that when when people become wealthier, uh, they don't spend more on food. They tend to specialize in what they consume in food. So they they like Italian food, or they like Cambodian food, or they drink finer finer wines of a certain type. And this specialization, it seems to me, has uh, characterized food. But in in talking to some food retailers uh, over the last two or three weeks, what they've told me is that these special categories, organic, has largely gone away. Um, other kinds of, um, uh, you know, uh, categories, I, you know, celiac, um, other than on a scale basis seems to have gone away. What is your, what is, what is your sense of how the food industry and the specialization of the food industry is going to, is going to play out? Are we, are we going back to all about being basics for basics or is it just a question of economic recovery and we're back to this specialization approach again. Yeah, so I think that you know that was a, an interesting question before all of this arose. Was you know what was uh, going on with the the question of 
I wouldn't say just specialization, but I think it's it's choice. And it, you know, if you go back to the 1980s in the United States, it's when Americans were sort of introduced to the concept of choice in their food supply. Uh, we went from having two types of uh, tomato sauce or pasta sauce in 1980 to having dozens of varieties by 1990. And so things have changed a lot. I think that uh, now there are so many new products that are being introduced every year that it was leading to a little bit of decision fatigue among consumers. They're going into the grocery store. There are so many choices, so many new brands um, that it becomes difficult for consumers to, to make decisions. And I think that possibly this is one of the things that's led to an increase in uh, private labels or store brands. Uh, that's certainly an area that Jessica probably knows far amount, uh, far more about than I do. Uh, so I, I'm definitely going to let her jump in on some of these. But I think that there there is definitely the possibility that we come out of this, especially with younger people, uh, less focused on having a huge number of choices and more willing to consider a, a narrow range of things that um, they can count on. Uh, would love to hear what Jessica has to say about it because she probably has all the data. Yeah, Jessica? Yeah, so what one thing that we did see coming out of 2008 and 2009 in the recession was the rise of the private label brands. Now, what's interesting is back then, there was a little bit of a stigma attached to those brands as they were viewed as lower tier quality and possibly second best alternatives to the big CPGs or the national brand labels that we have become familiar with over time. Over the past couple years and with this new decade uh, and especially with this new consumer base, whether it's the Xers or the Millennials or even the Alphas, they are much more comfortable with the private label brands. Now, part of that is because the retailers have done such a better job. Um, I think about a Kroger Simple Truth, which it was natural, organic, or free from 101 different ingredients. It didn't take a stand on those topics, but if you just wanted to know that the product didn't have those things in it, you could always just buy a Simple Truth label. You could go to the Whole Foods 360. Lidl and Aldi over in Europe have done a fabulous job uh, with their private label selections. So folks are much more comfortable and view the private label option as more intriguing today, and there isn't a stigma attached. So you will see those sectors really resurge. Something interesting in the stores that we should be paying attention to is this return to the comfort that Jack talked about. Now, what that tends to do is pull people away from the perimeter of the store, which was typically more profitable. Um, that's where the fresh is, those are where the impulse buys are, the higher label items, whether they were adult beverage, a booming category then and a booming category now in a pandemic. Um, but typically people tend to recede into the center of the store items, such as the pastas and the rice, the staples, things that are very comfortable and also preserve and hold well. Um, in that bunker phase, which is typically stage one, you know, post a major external shock like this, those tend to be lost leaders or deflationary items in a grocery store. So we're going to see some interesting trends in gross margin over the next couple quarters when grocers report. Something I'll just quickly pivot back to are some of the preferences. And what you were seeing generationally is that uh, the younger demographic, of course, was much more comfortable shopping online, and there was a big fight for that share of stomach. They were using the Grubhubs, the Uber Eats, all of these delivery service, and they effectively were agnostic regarding where it was coming from. They just wanted to have it be as little work and input as possible. They were also extremely tuned to brands that were socially conscious. So were you a brand that was known for wearing the white hat on the social impact space? Or were you a brand that um, had a negative stigma for how you treated your workers? Or did you have a bad carbon footprint, etc. So those were important topics. that I think actually COVID-19 will give us a really interesting chapter as we pull out to see which brands and which companies commit to a smaller footprint, which we're all having right now in COVID-19, and they commit to those things and carry them forward. Also, how brands treat their workers during this chapter will define their brands for generations to come. And when the economy bounces back, people will want to give their money and shop with 
and partner with and work for companies whose values match those of their own. So thinking long-term about what do you want the headline for your business to be in five years when you look back at your behavior during COVID-19 is an exercise that I encourage all executives and all managers to be thinking about right now. Think about your headline in five years from now. What do you want it to say about who you were? What's your purpose? What were your values? And did you stick to them? And if you're not happy with what that headline looks like, change your actions today before it's written for you. Hmm. Jessica, a, a couple of the things that you said in in your opening comments, I'd like to just tie them back into uh, to to this here. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that science and food with GMO and CRISPR has was gradually creeping into the system. Uh, anyhow, I think the willingness of a government to intervene. Um, on the principle of food and medicine, the willingness of corporations to engage. I think Nestle is at you know probably at the forefront uh, of that. Is it? Is it? Do you think that come back in five years' time, and the headlines for 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 the food industry will be twenty twenty was the year that science came back into food. Twenty twenty was the year when organic was found to be the fad you know or the the idea of the one percent that that it was and and today we think about food of course always as a celebration but now as a medicine is are we are we overestimating the shock in the in the system at this point or is it realistic to think that they might actually happen So I don't think we are overestimating the shock. Let's not forget, and I I love the way that David laid out these phases for us and where we were before, the gearing and the boom. Don't forget that in... February, or you know, even at the end of January, when everybody was in Davos, what we were talking about was climate change. Greta was the time person of the year because of her work on climate change. We were talking about um, you know climate grief, and that was when people were in New York for the UN meetings uh, in the fall. There were sessions on climate grief. People were sitting there thinking about, you know, just overcome with anxiety about the state of our planet. So don't forget that that was where we were. Now, COVID-19 has brought a radical rupture to some of those, you know, big picture thoughts that we were having as a global society, but they're inextricably linked. There is fabulous work being done by the Harvard School of Public Health, looking at the existence of viruses just like this. What was climate change doing to nurture global pandemics? Pandemics, etc. The world isn't ready to talk about those yet because we're just trying to get by one day at a time. But we should not underestimate the fact that these things are intrinsically connected. And if you think about some of the trends um, that we were already seeing with science re-entering, impossible or beyond meat, Memphis meats. I mean, the idea that cellular meat could be introduced possibly in a grocery store would have seemed infathomable a few years ago. But what people have decided and have, have understood is the link between food waste and greenhouse gas and what that is doing for climate change. I mean, I gave the statistic when I was at the World Food Prize um, talking about food waste. And if food waste was its own country, it would have more greenhouse gas emissions than any other country on earth outside of um, China and the US. So those are the two biggest polluters of greenhouse gases. Food waste, if it was its own nation, would be the third largest polluter of greenhouse gas in the world. We use landmass the size of India and Canada every year to grow food that's never eaten. And what that does to the atmosphere and to climate change is astronomical. So people were already interested in this discussion. So I think things like the different advents in the cell, in the plant-based technology or meat space, plus GMO salmon was a big discussion. And then something we rolled out at um, my retailer was appeal. The coatings that you put on the avocados and some of the other fruits and vegetables to improve the shelf life. Now, if you had told me we'd be putting a coating, like a scientific coating on the outside of produce to help improve the shelf life and everybody would be okay with that. If you told me that five years ago, I would say that's probably not going to happen. 
but people were really interested in prohibiting and cutting down on food waste. And these trends had already made inroads into the retail and business to consumer space because people were asking for them. David, uh, could, I, could I draw you back in here? Um, I, I'm very taken with the comments of 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 Jack and uh, and Jessica around these um, these very large changes. But you're an expert in, I guess, political economy, and the the politicians, the political leaders of the world, uh, the owners of capital in the world, haven't really been that interested in coping with. The environmental challenge of our time, uh, which seems to be the issue of our time, how how likely are they to engage with something like um, we can feed the whole world if only we embrace science, which is a very very contested issue, and the idea that we should think about food as medicine for for a food industry outsider, what is the appetite amongst politicians and the owners of capital? for this kind of change? Well, uh, Damon, can I just say that I am thoroughly enjoying listening to Jack and Jessica. It's fantastic. I'm learning loads of stuff. So thank you both uh, very much indeed. Uh, With respect to politics and how things are changing and political views of the food industry, my sense is that in actual fact, this is a generational thing. The younger generation, my own children, uh, people I teach at university or whatever, have a much more engaged idea with respect to the environment. I wouldn't go as far as to say politicians are not taking this on board, Damien. I think that what is happening is COVID has so profoundly changed the daily challenge of a politician. We're now in survival mode, but a lot of good intentions will be sucked in uh, to the by the energy of dealing with this crisis. On the geopolitical side of things, I think we haven't quite, as Europeans and Americans, understood the extent of the difficulties in the emerging and developing world right now. So if you think that this, is, this disease is a crowd disease, it's a disease that loves crowds, it loves slums, it loves people living on top of each other in very, very poor conditions. Therefore, it loves a country like India. It loves a country like Brazil, like Mexico, like the entire continent of Africa, where the average person is living in a totally different world to the average person in certainly in Northwestern Europe and and, and large parts of the United States, like all the United States. So I I worry that the next wave of this, uh, and it's very interesting talking, listening to Jessica and Jack talking about whether we're actually at an inflection point or whether or not we're just seeing other trends being amplified by the impact of COVID. But if you look at what's happening in the developing world, say south of the border in Latin America, so you have the exports of these countries have stopped. The health services of these countries are nothing like as well resourced as our health service. So there's no real choice for them about do we flatten the curve, do we not? Their choices are much more immediate. Tourism, which is one of their biggest hard currency exports, is over. You're seeing massive, massive capital flight from Mexico, from Argentina, from Brazil, to the United States, to the dollar. This means their budgets are going to be completely compromised and what they can do in the next 12 months. It means their tax revenue is completely compromised. And of course, what you get is a situation where the way in which this disease uh, deploys its awfulness upon people is splitting between rich countries and poor countries. And what tends to be the upshot of that, Damien, is mass migration from poor countries to rich countries. That's what happens. So Europeans can expect large-scale African migration in the next 12 months, and Americans can expect large-scale Latin American and Central American migration simply because the disease has this profoundly asymmetrical impact, whether you're wealthy or not. And then within the wealthy countries, and this goes back to the generational uh, ideas that that Jack was talking about, within the wealthy countries, there's a very clear split between now the European social democratic countries, uh, which are very, very big welfare states and very well-funded public health services, and, of course, the American model, 
Uh, and I think the the way in which a country deals with this as we come out, because again, you know, you have to acknowledge that these are crowd diseases. They've got four characteristics. The first one is they spread very quickly. The second one is they are acute diseases, i.e. the actual period of being ill, incubation and recovery is about four or five weeks. So they're very unusual in that sense. The third thing is the outcomes are either one or two. You either recover or you don't. There's no long term implication of this. And of course, the fourth thing is they only happen in humans in the sense that they only present themselves as, as illness in humans. So think about that. That's what we're all going to go through. That's what we're going through. The way in which governments deal with that is going to determine politics, and I, I come back to Jack's point, for a considerable number of time. Uh, very few incumbent politicians, if they get this wrong, will survive. Uh, I think you might see a wholesale clear out of the political class over the course of the next 24 months. Uh, this is particularly opposite for the United States. So it's got a presidential election coming up. And the interesting thing is, like all global crises, be they financial, be they military, be they geopolitical, what you need at the end is a leader, a global leader to set the rules. So, for example, the United States in the Bretton Woods system in 1945 after the Second World War basically said, come here, guys, we have a plan. It's a Marshall Plan. It's the IMF. It's the World Bank. It's the UN. We have it. We will take the leadership and we'll do this under the dollar. The dollar will be the reserve currency for the world. The world needs a leader of this type uh, over the course of the next 12 months. It's hard to see where that global leadership will come from. And that then comes back to the generations. How will younger generations vote? Because a lot of these younger people who we're saying might not necessarily have a, a very secure stake in society, but what they do have now is a vote. And as Jack said, I, and Jessica alluded to, this is changing their behavior. And one of their behaviors is political, social economic. And that actually feeds off itself in terms of group psychology. So my sense is that we are in for a big geopolitical and political rupture that we haven't really got our heads around. And the determining factor will be how the state deals with the inception of the crisis, the execution of the health service, and how quickly we recover, which brings you all the way back to my original point about the most crucial piece of data in the next five or six weeks, actually five or six days here in Europe, but I suspect me longer elsewhere, uh, is going to be on this antibody, because that will change the psychology, because people's psychology is now thinking, you know what, this could be quick, and we might come out of it, and then if we come out of it, we go back to normal. If the antibody data is suggests the opposite, then I think we will have a, a, quite a significant psychology. And then the world will need more leadership from, I'm not too sure where that's going to come from. Mm. David, I, I know um, you're something of a historian as well as an economist, uh, and you're re uh, currently researching yourself in terms of the impact of the plague uh, from seven or 800 years ago on global society. But uh, well, you know, let I'm, me I'm ask you a food nice person, really. To, go on. No, no, we, <laughs> well, we, know, we, no, no. we know that. We know that now. Um, if we thought about what you just said, specifically in terms of the food industry, that would mean that we would design a food industry for a hundred percent of the people, not ten percent of the people. That we would design Absolutely. a food industry that would mean that a hundred percent of the people could afford to buy the food that they need 100% uh, of, of the time, that you know a third of the world would not be eating itself to death and, and a third of the world would not be dying early because of, of hidden hunger, you know, micro, micro, lack of micronutrients. I wonder, in terms of your hi historical sweep, has that ever been done before? Because I, I can't think that it has. I think it's an impossible. Well, it's a very interesting question, and as I was interrupting you there, saying in actual fact, like I'm not, I'm not some sort of pandemic fetishist or anything like this. It's, uh, but I do think history gives us arms us with certain tools whereby we can at least begin to analyze what happens and what happens in the future, and um, because humans do have a terrible tendency to repeat ourselves uh, over and over again. 
what there's two very interesting examples. One is the 1918 flu, which we know came in three waves. Uh, very, very virulent. Started in Kansas in the United States, went to the European continent, brought by American troops on the Western Front. Then, as those troops demobbed all over the world, came back. It was called the Spanish flu because obviously the Spanish were neutral in the war, and they were the only people who reported it because the German and British and American side were not going to, French and French were not going to report on this pandemic amongst the troops because it would destroyed morale of the people at home. So, interestingly, to ask your question about big visions and changes and these moments, the reaction to the flu pandemic in Europe and the United States in 1920 was profoundly different. Uh, the United States responded uh, to the flu pandemic with an extraordinary decade of unbelievable innovation. Uh, you're talking about cars, you're talking about electricity, you're talking about radio, you're talking about telephone, you're talking about extraordinary innovative surge in the United States and an extraordinary, not just innovative surge, but an extraordinary emergence of an entrepreneurial class in the United States that was able to take those inventions and actually make them into sellable products, which is your point to whether or not an industry can react. So the United States' response to the flu pandemic uh, was an extraordinary. So, for example, the United States economy by the end of the 1920s was producing about 42% of global GDP, which is really a phenomenal in terms of a global hegemon. Now think about what happened in Europe. Uh, and I'm talking here Britain, Germany, France, and, of course, Russia, stroke Soviet Union, Italy, and Spain. What actually happened in Europe was precisely the opposite. Europeans reacted to a combination of the war plus the pandemic by going into our shells. Now, obviously, far more Europeans died in the pandemic than died in the First World War. Not only did we go into our shells, but we threw up all those barriers to trade, to innovation, to the free movement of ideas and people, etc. So by the mid-1920s, what you have is a Europe led by Germany, which is becoming atavistic, racist, a middle class that is shrinking, and a political firmament that is not only fragile, but actually toxic. We see very, something very similar in Britain, although it's rarely spoken about, uh, precisely the same in France, very, very fragile governments, anti-Semitism coming up. And again, what we know, what was happening in the Soviet Union was Stalin was, bu Stalin was busy uh, clearing out the top brass of the Bolsheviks and imposing the Soviet Union on the top, which had much more profound ramifications for Soviet farmers than Soviet workers. So take the big picture, Damien. Societies react differently to pandemics. I'll just give you one last other maybe point of optimism, which is the Black Death in 1347, which afflicted, came from uh, the far side of the Caspian Sea. Uh, and again, it was Genovese traders trading with uh, Tartar traders over there. It was a, a, a quite a different type of pandemic, but it was at the long-term implication. So I would describe that back in the woods in 1347 as our Wuhan. And that we're talking about beyond Crimea over there uh, in between Russia and the Ukraine. But the point is, the Black Death arrives in Europe in a city like Florence. Florence was the New York City of its time, extraordinarily brilliant place, wealthy, innovative, full of chutzpah, the whole thing. In the same way as New York has got hammered, maybe because of its very openness to trade and people, uh, Florence likewise. But then what we see, and this is the point, you know, in the same way as the United States reacted to the pandemic with enormous innovation in the 1920s, leading to the Roaring Twenties, Great Gatsby, all that sort of good stuff, uh, the movie theaters, etc. The post-traumatized post-pandemic Florence of the 14th century led directly to the flowering of what subsequently became known as the Renaissance, which was an amazing period of artistic, literary, and manufacturing innovation. So shocks have an amazing ability, Damien, to change the psychology of the country, our countries that have been affected by it, and if managed properly, generate these extraordinary growth spurts which come through because there's an energy. But, mm. and I come back to my quest, my, my issue, that demands leadership, yeah. both in the European Union, in the United States, and of course, the place we're not talking about now at all, which is China, from whence the disease emanated. 
So I think these are big questions that probably could be teased out. Yeah. Jack, this seems to tie back to your point earlier about about friction driving innovation. Would you like to join in? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, the the question of whether or not we can have, though, a a food system that delivers uh, 100% of uh, our needs, you know, it's challenging because you have different demands from a food system. So just feeding people sufficiently isn't enough. We also want to do it sustainably. We want to do it nutritiously. And some of these have tensions that uh, are pushing up against each other. And so coming out of this current crisis, on one hand, we're going to want to make sure that people are fed. On the other hand, there are countries that are going to want to make sure that they're more self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency means producing more locally. And producing more locally means purchasing fewer things globally. Um, And yet having global trade is what's going to reduce hunger in many parts of the developing world. And so we're going to end up with tensions like that when it comes to questions about sustainability. Well, local sustainability means reducing the amount of fertilizer and pesticides and insecticides and other things that you might be using on your piece of land. But that also may mean that we need more pieces of land in order to feed everybody. And that could have a decrease in global sustainability. So, you know, it it sounds like an easy question, but it ends up creating different tensions. So our food system has lots of problems, but when we solve one problem, you can just potentially shift uh, risk to a different part of the food system. Hmm. Jack, uh, David's comments uh, added with your comments, it just strikes me that perhaps one place where society is committed to having 100% of the population have access to the food that they need on a healthy and sustainable basis is, in fact, China. Do you, do you have any sense? Uh, I'd appreciate the project is underway there rather than completed. Do you have any sense about whether they, in fact, offer a role model for the rest of the world? They don't have the land and the water, I guess, but what, what is your sense of that? Well, again, it depends on, you know, if we're talking about uh, self-sufficiency versus global uh, trade. Uh, In China, they're able to meet their their food needs, uh, but it relies heavily on uh, imports from around the world. Uh, The country that's probably sending the most food to China, well, you have both the United States and Brazil. Uh, Their biggest imports are probably soybeans. And so China is highly dependent on global trade in order to meet those needs. However, there's also expectations when you're starting at sort of a a very low level of uh, sufficiency for hunger, uh, then, you know, just having sufficient food is enough. But as people economic situation changes, expectations also change. And so uh, what we see is that, you know, China did a, a very good job of reducing hunger over the last 30 years. And, and in fact, most of that uh, improvement from 36% of people being hungry to 12% uh, happened entirely or precisely because of China's uh, progress. But as that happens, people then want to move from, you know, uh, eating rice and grains and other things to having more meat. And so that creates more of a challenge on the system. So, uh, you know, it, it gets harder as you move along, and it's harder to get that last mile and reach, you know, those rural people. So, you know, it, it will become more difficult as China moves along, because they're actually approaching, you know, more of what has been achieved in the past in the US or Europe or other places. Okay, thank you. Jessica, you wanted to comment on the idea of food access in rural areas. Yeah. So thank you. I think there have been some great points made about the nation states and various geopolitical systems that are well positioned to perhaps be leadership models in a food system design going forward. Um, You know, I spent time in the former Soviet Union, and I actually wrote my master's thesis on the difference between collectivization in China versus collectivization in Russia. And, you know, there were some pretty dramatic um, biological fallout situations from the collective farms in the former Soviet Union. And I don't think you know, it's been a long time since those farms have been able to bounce back. So I'm not sure we would want to look at that necessarily as the right model forward. But I do think that no matter what political system you're in, that uh, you know David did such a great job capturing the, the ebbs and flows of how this all then ultimately plays out in political cycles, 
no matter what situation you're in or what political system or nation state you're inside of, there is this tension between the urban and the rural. And when we go out there and we look at um, the discussion with COVID-19, right now there's tons of discussion on access to the respirators, right? So what are the healthcare systems in the rural economies have available to them versus the big cities? And that is shedding light and drawing attention to the fact that, um, again, not all neighborhoods and areas within a country are created equal. Uh, That is exactly the same for the food supply chain. Jack just mentioned the last mile. We have seen over the years with this rationalization of the grocery retail footprint, a lot of grocery stores or independents have closed in small communities. That is actually what led to the rise of the Walmart Supercenter. Um, and you, you know, you can argue it both ways: which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did Walmart move in and then the small retailers die out, or vice versa? You know, did they come in to fill a need? It's it's a complicated discussion that we definitely won't get into here today. But what I will say is that this tension between the rural food access and the urban food access is real. And the food supply chain today isn't necessarily designed to be able to scale and feed 100% of the people because of the margin structure and the fact that, um, you know, a lot of this sourcing is done either locally, but then to make it work, you need infrastructure and scale to deliver food at the price point that people today are used to paying for it. So um, it'll be very interesting to manage that tension going forward. And I think it will be very hard to design a food system today uh, for the 100% given what we what we know about food perishability and also um, income disparity versus you know the different locales, whether it's urban or rural. Yeah. Jessica, I might I might stay with you for uh, for our next uh, our next discussion pool. Um, I was taken with your comments earlier on that uh, about the likelihood of switching to a wholly or a more substantially online model, but if you take Amazon out of it um, for a second. At least in Europe, and I suspect it's the same in the US, online grocery delivery has largely failed in this crisis. The systems are not there. The slots are not there. The variety is not there. I I wonder, might it, you know, sure, people are afraid to go to the store, but I'm not sure that their confidence is actually that high in, in, in online grocery. Why would you have the level of confidence that you would have uh, in its future growth? So I think there will be a couple things. Now, will we see 41% of people stay online for grocery shopping forever? Probably not. But will we see those who were afraid to try it or had these strange notions that uh, it couldn't be done properly uh, without yeah. you know their own personal intervention? They've broken through that barrier. I mean, I'll, lo- I'll use the uh, click and collect model, which is you order online and then you drive through and pick up, um, which is actually where my family is right now is picking up our Kroger order through the click and collect system. We heard a lot at Kroger that originally people didn't want to adopt the click and collect technology because they felt that, you know, they were the only one who could pick out the bananas that their family wanted, or, you know, they wanted to be able to test the ripeness of the mango themselves, et cetera. What we saw over time is that if they tried click and collect and got to know one of the personal shoppers, that actually that barrier went down pretty quickly. People would type into the comments, I want Charlie. Charlie is my picker. He always gets the bananas the way that I like them. So people are amazingly fungible in their preferences. You have to get them through the big um, inflection point of the go-to-market or the modality that they previously may not have used. But once we got them online, We saw that they were rapid adopters, but then also what was interesting is a lot of the Wall Street analysts were worried that it was going to cut into some of that incremental buying in the store. You know, people would walk around and impulse buy. What we found is nine times out of 10 that um, they would still do the click and collect, but come into the store because they had remembered things last minute or things had happened in the last 24 hours. So the incrementality of the shop 
still wasn't um, impaired and it was actually really good for business. These online Mm -hmm. models though are very expensive and to acquire those customers and to keep those customers is more expensive because you're shifting to a new modality. And that's where some of the structural and long-term aspects of retail grocery would be difficult. What I would say is if you're having a bad experience online or with digital in your grocery shopping, you're probably not alone uh, because there's this idea that... um, you know, a lot of these systems and these processes weren't necessarily designed for this originally. You have a Walmart that went out and bought a jet.com, which was a pure play e-commerce delivery solution from the beginning. And they embedded that into their operations, which means that it was very smoothly done. But big other grocery stores that just had IT systems that they've duct taped together may not necessarily be in the best place to handle the load and to deliver you the customer experience that you would have come to be sensitized to based on Amazon. I mean, that's what's interesting too about the customer experience, the CX or the UX. People don't differentiate between grocery versus going into a Tiffany store. If they've had a great CX or a great UX, um, and in the online space, Amazon is probably the gold standard. If they've had that, they extrapolate it and they expect every other online retailer to deliver it without understanding that necessarily the pieces or the infrastructure isn't there to be able to support that type of customer experience. So it doesn't surprise me, um, but you've broken through that fourth wall, yeah. that big barrier, which was getting people online to be able to try it for the first time. Yeah. Jack, could I invite you in maybe to comment a little bit on on this, uh, you know, the early adopters and uh, majority adoption of of, uh, of online grocery? And, and also, it seems to me that the particularly the retail chains have got so efficient. And of course, they drive that efficiency the whole way down the chain that maybe we've lost some of the resilience in the chain and maybe we need to invest a little bit more in creating in buffers. So the adopter to majority and the idea of buffers in the food chain as well, if that would be okay. When we think about early adopters and new technologies, usually you know there's 5% of people who are just willing to try new things. These early adopters, and, and this is true of new technologies, new foods, uh, all sorts of things in our daily lives. And so it's, there's always somebody first. And you know Jessica mentioned that about 4% of people were doing their shopping online for food. And those were a different group of people than the people who were not doing it. Um, mentally, psychologically, economically, it was a different group. And so the fact that we now have this uh, huge number of people, you know, whether it's uh, 40%, uh, a third of people um, who are now trying and that number is likely to increase, those are not early adopters. Those are just your average person. And if the experience was bad, um, in many ways, you would expect them not to come back. But this current situation is such that those people are probably going to continue to to try and figure out how the system works. And so I, I would say that you know, we, we are in for a, a lasting change in how people think about food. Because once people get over that barrier, the companies begin to respond. Uh, there's really no going back because you know, people may not do it every day, but they know that they can do it and there's no particular barrier to them doing it again. Uh, the second thing uh, I want to talk about, you know, relates to the resilience of our food system and how things are going to change. And here, I think we have this uh, interesting uh, change because if we looked uh, over the last uh, ten or twenty years, a lot of companies were moving to having just-in-time deliveries. So, if you have ingredients or parts or other things, you want them to show up when you need them. So, there has been this huge reduction in inventory. And, you know, that's been considered a really good thing because it increases efficiency and reduces cost. Now, all of a sudden, people realize, well, there's actually a value to having inventory because when there is a spike in price or quantity or a disruption in our global supply chains, what are you going to do? And so I think a lot of companies are going to have to figure out, you know, is it necessary to increase our capacity to have inventory in order to have resilience, in order to be prepared for the next disruption or crisis. 
Yeah. I think the economics of the chain and the economics of retail, as, as Jessica mentioned earlier on, are are, are about to get really interesting and and, uh, and perhaps lead us towards a situation of higher food prices, um, which uh, certainly I wouldn't necessarily think is a is a bad thing. David, I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to draw you in on our our, our next theme uh, first, if if that's okay. And if I, um, if I could, uh, Damien, if I could just add so, to the final yeah. comment there on what yeah, Jack was but, saying. Look, never again will Western countries allow themselves to be in the position where they're filing orders to China for ventilators. This is all going to stop. There is going to be the nationalization of all supply chains. I'm talking about pharma. I'm talking about food. This is a big moment. This is not just a moment where people's micro habits change. They do, and they are profoundly interesting. But macro habits will change. We have got this appalling situation for West Europeans where we are in a queue now with Americans looking for PPE equipment for our hospitals. All that's going to change is to Jack's point about inventory, that we are going to nationalize particularly the three big blocks, the United States, the European Union, and China has already and had already nationalized its supply chain. The second thing, and I don't want to make too far a point of it, but people will not forget this either, is that this virus came from the Chinese wet markets. It came from the Chinese food supply chain. There will be, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but there will be a reaction to that. My sense is there will be not an aversion to, but a, certainly a questioning of global supply chains, globalisms. It's unfortunate for a country like Ireland because we've managed, as you know, Damien, to put ourselves at the center of global supply chains, of the just-in-time uh, business, particularly in pharma. Uh, I think that we have to really draw back and take some altitude from what's going on. And the altitude is picking up what Jack said. Inventory is now, inventory is now cool again. Inventory was very uncool for 25 years. It's now cool again. You need stock you need stuff. Now, that might change, but the immediate reaction will be in the next few years, infantry is what actually saves you. There is no way the United States or Western Europe is going to be dependent on China for essential pharmaceutical and medical supplies. That's just, that just ain't going to happen. And the same feeling will percolate down into our, supply, our food supplies as well. So I would say we might see a contraction of the extent of the supply chain. And we will basically trade with countries that we trust, that we like, and that we are happy that we've understood the, what I would describe as the tail risks in, in, the, in the trade. I, I think these are huge cha changes that we're only now beginning to think about. David, I, I think your comment are, are uh, as profound as they always are. Um, I, I think on the food safety issue, maybe I'll just make a point uh, on the base of my own experience, but I've spent a lot of time in China over the last uh, 10 or 12 years. And I think the commitment and action of the Chinese government uh, to make dairy safe after the melamine scare and more recently to substantially reduce the size of the swine herd in order to drive food safety is just are just two indications of the level of, of of understanding and commitment that the the Chinese government has has to food safety. Now the the rest of the world uh, might decide to interpret that in a different way, but I think the Chinese government and people are, are very well aware of that uh, from their from their from their own 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 point of view. But you know, I'm not an economist. I studied economics, of course. Uh, my professor is another well-known uh, person around Dublin, David, but well, wasn't as good as you. But one of the things which he taught was um, the idea of, of relative advantage, that the reason why these products are produced in China is because they're better at producing them in China than we are in Europe or in the United States or in Brazil. And if what you say is true, and I always believe what you say, so I'm believing you now, we're all going to be poorer as a result of that through the misapplication of capital. Is that's that fair? Very, uh, that's, it is, 
David, that is probably fair if the world was a Petri dish where the only concern was the return on shareholder capital or the rate of return on capital. But it's not. The, the world is full of these crazy animals called humans. Us, slightly irrational, incredibly odd, as Jessica and Jack, who study the human psychology much more than I do, will attest to even people's shopping, you, you know, you, you buy things uh, in supermarkets because other people buy things. That's why you panic, right? So I take your point. I just think that economics and certainly classical economics, you know, what we're talking about, will, will be actually put in suspension. Uh, the, the, the market economy that we know uh, and that we work in and that, 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 is, that provides us with our living uh, has been suspended for the time being. Uh, and that is what is happening with the lockdowns. It's a suspension of capitalism and something that looks, feels and smells a lot more like socialism is vogue at the moment. So, for example, the airlines mm -hmm. are being bailed out by the federal government. The casinos are being bailed out by the federal government. Same thing happening here. So we're in a strange situation where I'm not too sure who's going to own the capital at the end of all this. Okay. It looks yeah. like the state's going to own a lot more of it, and then that'll have to be reallocated and resold, okay? which can be done. But to come back to, to, to my point uh, is, if you're, if you're advising the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, or you're advising Angela Merkel, or you're advising Donald Trump, and you say, uh, this crisis has been made more problematic and the panic has been made much more existential uh, because we don't produce these things. Ventilators, hospital beds, mm. PPE equipment. The reaction is going to be, okay, the lesson we're going to learn is produce them. So if there is a small or even significant price differential, it will be subservient to the security of the nation and the nation's and I think that's how nations react. If you look at the European Union, the European Union was set up as a coal and steel uh, union in 1957. Uh, the common agricultural policy was set up at the same time in order to ensure food supply because Europeans do not forget that Europeans starved after the Second World War. Europeans starved in 1945 and 1946 and 1947. Yeah. Uh, and so what I'm saying is that these events, Damien, have significant ramifications that are not always evident when you're in the eye of the storm and become much more evident when things ease up a little bit and people say, okay, what lessons did we learn? So my sense is that the 30-year period since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rise of China as an alternative supply source for large parts of the developed and the developing world will be affected by this crisis. Jack, um, you talked a little earlier on about the opportunity as a result of these kinds of frictions for innovation and technology. Uh, would you like to would you like to join again here? Yeah, when we think about uh, innovation, I think there's often a worry about, you know, how they're going to have an impact on our lives. And you know, one example of that is just robotics. And I think when people think about robotics today, there's a lot of concern about it taking jobs, you know, taking manufacturing jobs away from Americans. And when you look a little bit further down the road, you begin to see different implications of technology than just those sort of direct impacts. And, and this relates to a little bit of what uh, David was saying, is that uh, when you look at a place like China, well, you know, part of the reason that we're producing all of these products in China um, is not that they're just better at producing these products than us. That you know, they have cheap labor cost. You know, labor is probably the single greatest driver of manufacturing going to China. Well, if the current situation uh, leads to greater adoption of robotics and uh, automation, well, why are we producing those products in China at all? Because as labor cost comes down, then the cost of transportation becomes a more significant component of the cost of the good. Well, why not then bring manufacturing back to the United States or Europe or other places? And so uh, when I look at what some of the sort of second order repercussions of this, uh, 
instead of the uh, reducing the supply chain and taking control of the supply chain and bringing some of that production back to the United States, causing an increase in cost, um, it may just cause an increase in automation that ultimately reduces cost, increases uh, job opportunities um, in uh, the places where they're, they're being produced. And so uh, it's, it creates these interesting dynamics, and I'm not sure how, that we know exactly how they're going to fall out yet. Mm. Jessica, you had some experience this technology also with uh, with online grocery and automation of the supply chain. Would you like to Would you like to comment? Yes. Yeah, so a couple advents had entered into the U.S. system. Uh, as we mentioned, we talked about Acado before, which was a U.K. export, and they've actually licensed that technology to um, French retail supermarkets, Sobeys in Canada as well as other retailers around the world. And that was what was powerful. Um, the algorithm that underpinned the robots in the warehouses for picking the orders. And it operated like a hub and spoke model. So it was really quite interesting and quite inventive. So I think you have uh, systems that have developed and have become uh, well adopted and understood in certain markets that were about to be exported around the world and implemented that will see great success. I mean, right now, people want as few people as possible involved in the touching, handling, and experience of their food. We ordered pizza last night, and there was the contactless delivery option that we were able to employ. So that frictionless experience is helping people feel safer. Now, whether that's a perceived threat or something that we're just doing as we struggle for control um, is one that we'll have to see. Another big technology that you've seen are the autonomous vehicles. Now, there are only a few markets in the U.S. where we're allowed to deploy those, but um, we actually had an autonomous vehicle that you go ahead, place your order, the little robot car drives up, you get a um, code on your cell phone, you enter the code on the keypad, and the gates go up, like you know something out of the or Back to the Future, that movie where the... the car doors came up or the Tesla X um, with the wings and the doors came up, you reached in, you grabbed your groceries and off the little robot car went. Um, so that is truly a you know frictionless experience outside of um, having people involved in your grocery shop. So a couple things about like, where is this all headed as we pull out of 2020? It's way too early to be able to say, um, you know, what are these big seismic shifts that will forever impact our society? But I think definitely we will see a change from frictionless to touchless, less contact and interaction. I mean, I've heard some people say, like, why do we shake hands anyway? Like, why why have we kept on to this uh, tradition of, you know, shaking hands physically? So are we going to elbow bump forever? We'll see. Um, but another thing that you're seeing a lot of is, of course, the more online shopping that we talked about, tele-anything, so telemedicine, telehealth, all of these trends that were previously much more high-touch and personal, uh, people are having to have uh, done via the computer, whether it's their workspace or their telehealth needs, et cetera. So increasingly, you need a stronger digital infrastructure, so that cyberspace is being, um, you know, shored up right now, and we're going to have cyber threats, which will, of course, lead to different um, national security threats and the way that political systems react to that. The other big thing that was really starting to take off in the discussion was around the use of big data and the internet of things. Like we've seen a lot of these heat maps and big data be able to help us track the disease and be, be able to help us analyze these mega trends underneath the surface. Um, in grocery retail, we have been looking at big data for so, some time. Um, we had the ability to look back on your shopping history and know what were the patterns of how America ate, how did your household eat, and we were starting to reset the grocery store based on what that zip code liked best, Jiffy or Skip peanut butter. We would set the, the um, you know retail category assortments accordingly. So the use of big data will also be a trend that will go forward um, and really play an important role as we are emerging from COVID-19. Mm. As we uh, sort of move towards the end here, I might, I might ask the three of you to to think a little bit about something and Jessica I'll stay with you if, if it's if it's okay because I think you were heading in heading in that direction um I, I think the idea of asking when when will this be over uh, is pointless 
Uh, it may never be over, as you say, Jessica. We may never shake hands again. I, I'm not sure who's going to tell our Italian, French, and Spanish friends uh, about the lack of social contact, but that's that could be fun for another day. Um, if we sort of thought about this crisis as a series of waves, what do you think are the immediate next two or three waves of this crisis? And then... What are the actions individually, the, the next steps, not, not in three years' time, but what have we got to do today as business leaders of large businesses like Alltech and, and smaller family businesses, local retailers, feed mills uh, around the world? What are the next steps we have to take as individuals and corporations? And then what do these next two or three waves look like? And Jessica, I'll stay with you and start with you if that's okay. Sure. So I think there's an incredibly important psychological component underpinning all of COVID-19. And what I loved about Jack's comments and the, the conversation that we've had is it's been incredibly broad ranging, but it's very rooted in, you know, how do my neural pathways work and what am I used to as a human? Because the experience is very real and very personal, but then you take that and you scale it across the 8 billion people or whomever um, is the latest count that we've had on our global count. We are all experienced a singular shock at the same moment in history. I used to joke with my husband or my workplace and say, you know, thank God we're not all crazy on the same day. You know, we kind of evened each other out as humanity a little bit. But now we are going through something as a global society for the first time in history in a way that we just never have before. And if I look at what I've learned throughout my experience in communications and in large businesses, Something so fundamental to the human experience is our ability to change and adapt. And I'm a big fan of the Kubler Ross change curve. And, you know, you kind of have people in denial, then you drop, drop down into despair. People tend to rattle around in the valley of despair for a while and eventually have acceptance and pull out into the future. What I think is important is People need different types of communication based on where they are on that change curve. And what is different about this crisis a little bit is your point that we don't know exactly when the end is in sight. And the human brain is actually pretty bad at adjusting if we can't see an end to something and we have no ability to um, see that light at the end of the tunnel. So what I would tell business leaders in this ecosystem and part of the all tech community and, and this family is to think about how to break COVID-19 and this pandemic down into smaller and more manageable pieces for the people who are looking to you for leadership and inspiration. And don't forget that if they're at the beginning of that change curve or rolling around in the pit of despair, what they need psychologically and proven through data and statistics, what they need is high context information tell them what is going on. So they need more frequency and they need more details. Even if you don't feel like you have a lot of details, repeat the details that you gave them before because that's what they're craving. Um, and then as we start pulling out of some of this and in the, in the change curve, they are able to process more aspirational and inspirational visionary communications. So what we're gonna see is from great companies and great leaders, if you break it down into small pieces, 100 days, 30 days, whatever it is you choose to use, it will help people to develop a change resilience that will serve your organization well and will serve our society well. We can't change the fact that the human mind goes through a change curve, no matter what. The only thing we can change is how fast we can pull ourselves through it and how deep we go into the well of despair. So, you know, if we're going to be optimistic about this and give you some tangible things to take away, communicate early and often, break it into manageable segments for your people, even if you're kind of making up arbitrary um, breaks in the system. I mean, think about our calendar, like the week is arbitrary. The only the, the, we actually have a month because it's based on the moon, but breaking up our work week into days, five days, and then two days was an arbitrary break. But we did that for the human psychology. Break things up for your people 
in a way that they can process it, communicate high context for those who need it early in the change curve. And once we're starting to come out, be inspirational and visionary um, and always give people the why behind what it is that you're doing. And the why behind what we do as the food supply chain is so powerful. We have the most purpose-driven sector on the planet. Serving people's needs and getting them safe and affordable and nutritious food is a calling that we in the food service and the food supply chain take very seriously. So people should feel better than ever about being part of the agricultural food supply chain. I, I, I entirely agree with everything you said, but particularly your last comment that I've made a point of it myself, to just to remind people at this difficult time how important what we do in the food industry uh, actually is. Uh, Jack, um, answer as you as you wish. I'm trying to think about the the next two or three waves of this of this crisis, and then the actions which individuals and corporations might take, the next steps that they might take uh, today and uh, on on Monday when we go back to the office. Yeah, so I I'm not sure that I have a, a ton of things to add to what Jessica said. I, I think she did a good job. Uh, my biggest piece of advice to companies and to leaders and the, in the people that are on this webcast are to recognize that we are not the average person. We're not the average consumer. Uh, we're still working. We're still engaged. Most of us are still have an income. And it's going to be really difficult to make sure that you understand uh, what the rest of the world is going through, what the rest of your community is going through. And that's why it's, it's important for leaders to make sure that they really do have their finger on the pulse of what everybody in their organization is doing. So not just the people that are in your office, but the people that are furloughed, the people that um, are having to stay home, the people that are trying to take care of loved ones and others. That, that's going to be a little bit difficult to do because uh, the people that are hit the hardest from this um, are often economically and socially separate from those of us that are on this call. And so I, I think that it's just important that we recognize that we're not the average person. You know, we, we probably feel like we represent, uh, you know, the average American or the average European or others. Um, but the reality is that we don't, and we have to make that special effort to understand what others are going through. And then if we do that, then I, I think that brings us to some of the things that Jessica said about uh, as organizations, it's an opportunity to reach out to those people that are suffering the most and to let them know that you're aware of what's happening, that you appreciate the situation that they have, and that you're doing what you can in order to uh lighten their load at this very difficult time. And so I think in the next uh, couple of periods, there's going to be moving from, you know, just trying to figure out how to operate to understanding what people are going through, and then taking steps to, to begin to uh, uh, help people to recover and to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks. And I think most people haven't had a chance to really uh, focus on how bad things are going to get for many, many people. Yeah. I think the that idea of empathy, Jack, is uh, never, never a wasted, uh, never a wasted message. David, I I know that um, I know that economists have no empathy for anybody, um, but um, <laughs> wonder could I? <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. You're such a you're such a sweetheart. You're such a charmer. You know, I feel I'm in, I mean, I feel I'm loved here, man. I couldn't Talk resist. I couldn't resist. Um, how does this how does this crisis look? What are the next immediate two or three waves um, over the next uh, you know period of time, as you wish? And then, what are the kinds of actions that individual leaders and corporations need to take to get through that? Well, I think the first thing uh, to not just understand, but to, re to reiterate is that this crisis will pass. This is, as we said, a, a growth disease pandemic, flu, measles, rubella, these type of diseases. Uh, and they have, as I said before, a shelf life, which is finite, an outcome, which is the vast majority of people recover without needing hospitalization. And then once the virus has passed through the susceptible population, the virus uh, breeds itself out in a sense. So 
the time horizon is quite narrow. But what we do now is unbelievably important. I think it was Martin Luther King who said, talked about the extreme urgency of now. Now is it because how we behave today and in the coming weeks will determine how we come out of this crisis. And I think the other thing about crisis is that in a crisis, everything shifts. So what was radical becomes mainstream and what was mainstream becomes redundant in terms of ideas. So it strikes me that in terms of leadership on the economy, at least, uh, the Federal Reserve and the American Treasury need to spend as much money as is necessary. Uh, they need to monetize that so that the American debt GDP ratio doesn't go through the roof. Uh, similarly, European uh, policymakers and all around the world. Uh, and I think we're getting to that situation. I think we are getting to that situation. And... If that is done, the global and general economic impact will be flattened like the curve. Okay, so we won't have this terrible spike. We will have, have something a little bit more moderate. Then we can look beyond the crisis. And I, I go back to history, and I think these crises occur, they change, and they lead to extraordinary innovation if leaders step up and lead. And the example of the United States in the 1920s, I think, is probably a nice place to conclude in terms of historical evidence that suggests that crises, health crises, political crises, economic crises, can lead to extraordinary innovation and put us onto a higher growth plane afterwards. But again, as I come back, that is a function of what we do now. And now is the only urgent thing that we should be focusing on. David, thank you. Um, friends, uh, let me on behalf of the audience and behalf of Alltech, thank, uh, thank uh, Jack, uh, David and Jessica for their, I, I think, outstanding contribution today. I've, I've learned a ton uh, and uh, I've written pages and pages of notes here. If I was to try and summarize a, a, a little bit, I, I think it sort of boils down to thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you're learning about the food industry, David. That's another, uh, I'm sure, I, another, yeah, there you go. We've all got it. Um, but I think, I think what's, what's clear is, I, I think. Food art articles by me. There you go. My weekly column and podcast will be all about food. I'm going to say, how did you become an expert on food? So we're in this one off shock uh, kind of phase. We, um, you know, we keep saying these one-off shocks, but this actually genuinely does appear to be uh, to be a one-off uh, shock. But I think what if you listened uh, carefully to what our three friends uh, and colleagues said, what they very quickly, after explaining the shock to us, moved to was the idea of opportunities. And um, I think both in the consumer side uh, with Jack, on the supply side with Jessica, and of course then in the macroeconomic sense and, and political economy sense uh, with David, that there are opportunities for people who want opportunities. There will be growth again for those firms that want to be growth organizations again. But what it all boils down to uh, is your willingness to step forward and to act as a leader in society uh, and and uh, and in your in your industry, uh, these are characteristics, of course, which Alltech is famous for, and we look forward uh, to uh, to hearing more from Alltech on this topic and uh, and uh, Dr. Mark Lyons and his team. Uh, let me just conclude on behalf of everybody and say uh, thank you for listening, and uh, stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you at the Alltech One conference uh, virtually um, next month and uh, in person, hopefully in Lexington in 2021. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. What an incredible discussion. Thank you, Damien, David, Jessica, and Jack. You've given us so much to think about, and clearly there's an abundance of opportunity.